Welcome to Upon This Rock, our midweek Bible study from Solid Rock, Drogheda. The format is so simple. Janice is going to bring us a worship song, and I'm going to invite you to worship along with her. And then I'm going to open my Bible here, and uh, I'm going to share with you what the Lord is showing me and what the Lord has shown me in studying these scriptures many times. This is not a sermon. It's not, uh, I've not prepared uh, sermon points to share with you today. This is a Bible study and I'm inviting you to join me in my study for the Bible study. So first of all, uh, let's worship along with Janice.
So once again, we say thank you to Janice for leading us uh, so wonderfully in worship. And now we're coming back to John's Gospel again. And where we finished up last week was in John chapter 12. And we, if you remember, we talked about the anointing whenever Mary anointed the, Jesus uh, at her house in Bethany. And then we looked at the triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And we saw how John's, John's version of it is much shorter and yet had details in it about the motivation of what was going on that the other Gospels did not contain. And now we're joining it again at John chapter 12 and verse 20. It says, Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. And Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Now, Andrew, when we see Andrew in the Gospels, he's always bringing people to Jesus. You know, right, right at the beginning, when we looked at John chapter 1, there was Andrew bringing people to Jesus. Uh, of course, he was the one that brought the boy with the loaves and the fishes to Jesus. And now he's coming uh, on behalf of the Greeks to Jesus. Andrew just seems to be the accessibility door for people who want to come to Jesus. How we need more Andrews in the Church of Jesus Christ. Now, it's interesting that the Greeks are coming to look at wanting to talk to Jesus now. Because uh, we know from the Synoptic Gospels, particularly Mark's Gospel, that on the day of the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday, that Jesus cleansed the temple. Now, John doesn't record that. John actually recorded a previous cleansing of the temple uh, two or three years earlier. But uh, it, Jesus has just cleansed the temple. And when he did so, he said, this is supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations. And, uh, and the we just read where the Pharisees and the religious leaders were saying all the world is following him. Not just all Israel, not just all Jerusalem, but all the world. And now a couple of days later, because what, what we're reading now, there is a, a about a two day gap between uh, John chapter 12, verse 19 uh, and verse 20. And now a couple of days later, here these Greeks are coming to him. You know, all of this is a preparation for Christ to die on the cross for the sins of the world, for the day of Pentecost that's going to come not too long afterwards, whenever people in different languages will, will speak uh, and praise God, and, and also preparing the way for Israel's destiny, because Israel was to be a light to the nations, and it was Christ's death and resurrection and ascension into heaven and the pouring out of the Spirit that was to fulfill that destiny for Israel. And so now the Greeks, the nations, are coming to see Jesus. Uh, John obviously is picking up on something very prophetic and very meaningful here. And so when they come to Jesus, it says, Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. No, no, that's a strange response. You know, here were people wanting to see Jesus, and Jesus starts talking about seeds falling into the ground and dying. What he's saying is this. He's saying that if they really want to see him, then they're going to see him on the cross in a few days' time. That that's going to be the fulfillment of, of what's going on here. Because if they really want to see him, it's no good just seeing a miracle worker. It's no good just seeing a powerful preacher. They've got to see the Savior dying for their sins and Jesus is saying this is him this is how he's going to be revealed to everybody through his death upon the cross but he doesn't stop there by talking about his own death upon the cross verse 25 the man who loves his life will lose it while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life whoever serves me must follow me and where I am my servant also will be my father will honor the one who serves me. So what Jesus is saying here, he's saying, you're going to see me revealed for who I am when I die upon the cross. Not all, all the people here in Jerusalem and the nations. He's saying, and then my followers, those that are prepared to follow me, are going to have to be prepared to maybe share the same destiny. That maybe they are going to die and uh, be executed 
for their faith. You see, today we've often reduced the gospel to Jesus suffered so we don't have to. Jesus died on the cross and suffered, and therefore we can live a life of comfort and ease and prosperity and everything handed to us on a plate. The Bible doesn't actually say that. The Bible does say when we're serving him, he's going to meet or provide everything that we need and more than enough in order to serve him. But the Bible doesn't promise us a life of comfort. The Bible doesn't say, well, because Jesus suffered, you're grand, you're never going to have to suffer. The Bible says Jesus suffered on the cross and you might have to bear your cross as well. Now, whether we will or not, we don't know, but we need to be aware of that. Because today we live in an age when a lot of Christians, if they're called upon to bear their cross, they start saying, what's happened? I didn't know this was part of the deal. I thought Jesus died to save me from this. So Jesus, as soon as he talks about his own death, he goes on to say that many of his followers will have to make a similar sacrifice. Verse 27. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Jesus is saying, look, this is not easy. The gospel is not an easy message. It's free, but it's not easy. It's all of grace, but it's not easy. So, and Jesus himself is having a temptation to be afraid, assailing him. Now, he doesn't give in to that temptation. He doesn't collapse in fear. But he's, he's facing that, and he, he's, he knows that what he's facing is going to be the most difficult thing that anyone has ever done in history. And then a voice from heaven, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. And Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. So a voice speaks from heaven. Same thing happened when he was baptized. Same thing happened when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. Then the Father spoke from heaven. And now the Father speaks a voice from heaven again and here we see you know some people say oh but if only god would make things clearer for me but even when a voice from heaven speaks there are people who deny it there are people who reject it there are people who say ah oh, well it was it, it was just thunder and jesus says this was not for his benefit that the voice was speaking this was for the crowds benefit because god is bringing them to a place of decision making and the decision that they make about Christ will determine the decision that the Father makes about them. He's saying now's the time for judgment on this world. Now's the time for judgment upon Satan. And he said he's showing what kind of death he was going to die. So he's saying this for the crowd's benefit. The voice spoke for the crowd's benefit. And Jesus prophesied the cross in language that was very similar to John chapter 3. Remember when he said about Moses... Uh, and the serpent in the wilderness that if the serpent was lifted up people looked to it and, and were healed and, and Jesus said I too will be lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness the son of man and now he's saying it again I when I am lifted up from the earth will draw all men unto me and the crowd then responded to that the crowd spoke up we have heard from the law that the Christ will remain forever so how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? See, the crowd understood his references to crucifixion. Uh, he didn't, it might say, just saying by saying, I, if I am lifted up, we might say, well, did they, maybe they didn't get that. They got it. They understand he's talking about crucifixion. And that's why they're immediately objecting, because, of, because that clashes with their preconceptions about the Messiah. Because they're saying, hang on, the Messiah is this eternal figure. And if, if he's crucified, that's a contradiction of the Messiah's eternity. Whereas Jesus is saying that crucifixion is not the contradiction of the Messiah's eternity, eternal nature, but crucifixion is the confirmation 
of the Messiah's eternal nature. Because the only way that crucifixion could be effective for us, for salvation, given that we have sinned against an infinite eternal God, would be for an eternal being to be sacrificed on the cross in our place. And so they saw crucifixion as a contradiction of the Messiah's eternal nature. Jesus saw it as a confirmation of his eternal nature. Uh, and then Jesus told them, verse 35, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. Again, very much the language of John chapter 1, the light shining in the darkness and him giving us the power to become the sons of God. And he says, believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. And when he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. Uh, and this is a, a recurring theme in John's gospel. John is, you know, John's gospel is evangelistic. John said, these things are written that you might believe and that by believing you might have life in his name. And like every good evangelist, John doesn't just hang it out there and say, okay, go and think about that and do with it what you want. He wants to bring them to a point of decision. Because without reaching a point of decision, all the knowledge they learn about Jesus is not going to benefit them. And so he focuses in on things that Jesus said about that. And this is the third time that we've seen John focus in on Jesus saying this kind of thing, where he says, you know, believe in the light while you have the light. Darkness is coming when no man can work. So this is a recurring theme of John is saying to his readers, when you read this and you realize who Jesus is, then believe in him now. Don't mess around. Don't put it off. Today is the day of salvation. Verse 37. Even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? That's from Isaiah 53. For this reason... They could not believe because, as Isaiah says elsewhere uh, in Isaiah chapter, chapter 6, he has blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts so that they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn, and I would heal them. And then uh, verse 40, 41 says, Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Now, Elsewhere in the other Gospels, uh, Jesus used these verses from Isaiah about people's eyes being blinded that they would not believe and used it to talk about why he spoke in parables. Now, John's actually using it to explain why people rejected Jesus, not when they heard a parable, but when they heard God's voice itself speaking from heaven. And John's, so John's taking it a little bit further and he's saying this, it doesn't matter whether the truth is in parables or laid out in a crystal clear way that no one can deny, that there still are those that will reject him. Because ultimately there are people who reject Christ and that is not an intellectual problem that stops them believing. It is a moral problem that they don't want to surrender their lives to Jesus and therefore they will invent any excuse they can. Put it in a parable, they'll say they don't understand the parable. Give them a voice speaking from heaven, they'll say it's thunder. Any excuse to avoid facing the truth and the claims of Jesus on their life. Verse 42. Yet at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. True Christianity takes courage. True Christianity is not just going with the flow and taking the path of least resistance. Sometimes it takes guts to follow Jesus. You know, I've been discovering this in my own life. There's been times when I've been saying things and preaching things and everybody seemed glad to hear them. There's other times I've been sharing truth and people get offended at truth and people don't want to hang around truth and people choose to go elsewhere because they don't like the truth. However, we have to speak truth. 
we have to be courageous in proclaiming the gospel, even if it makes us unpopular and e even if it causes a bit of unpleasantness sometimes. We've still got to speak truth. We can't water down the gospel. But here there were people who they believed in Jesus, but they would not openly acknowledge their faith because they were afraid of the religious leaders and thought they would be put out of the synagogue. Verse 44. And then Jesus cried out. And this is significant because really after these next few verses, we get into John 13. That's where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. We have the Last Supper. We have the upper room ministry. And so this, apart from when he was on the cross and crying out on the cross, this is the last time that Jesus speaks to the crowd, to the multitude. It's the last bit of public ministry, if you like, before he goes into the upper room experience with his disciples. And so Jesus cried out, when a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. And when he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Jesus cries out to the crowd, but and in that he issues one more call to make a decision. And then verse 47, there is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. But that very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. For I did not speak of my own accord, but the father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the father has told me to say. So Jesus says to them, and we're going to close with this. Jesus says he has not come to judge on this occasion. He has come to save. But the people's reaction to his offer of salvation will determine the judgment that they will later receive. And so, again, John's bringing us back to that point of decision. He's saying you can't mess around. You need to make a choice. If you love God, then you will love Jesus. If you reject Jesus, you reject God. Make your decision. It's make your mind up time. This is why John's gospel is such a great gospel for evangelism. And I'm involved in a national evangelistic campaign next year. And as part of that, we're giving away copies of John's gospel to loads of people. And the reason is because John's gospel is great for sharing the gospel and, uh, and, and evangelism because it calls people to that point of decision. And that brings us to the end of John chapter 12. And uh, next week, we're going to get into John chapter 13, which of course is the beginning of the upper room ministry and the washing of the disciples' feet. And I really believe God's going to show us some great things then. So do join us next Wednesday again, 7.30 p.m. here in my study. Same time, same place. It's available on our website, solidrock.ie, or on our Facebook page, Solid Rock. I do hope you'll join us. And in the meanwhile, God bless you.